This week, Future Hindsight is presented by Blue Bottle Coffee. If you know me, you know that I believe coffee is the elixir of life, which is why I'm so excited that Blue Bottle Coffee is sponsoring this episode. They're passionate about offering coffee from the finest sourced beans and serving it at peak deliciousness. Whether you're visiting one of their cafes or subscribing to custom coffee delivery services online, you can taste a wide selection of fresh roasted whole beans from across the world shipped right to your door with Blue Bottle Coffee's convenient subscription service on your own schedule. Head over to bluebottlecoffee.com slash listen to get your first 12-ounce bag of whole beans, normally a $20 value for just $5. Again, that's bluebottlecoffee.com slash listen. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Mari Matsuda. She's a lawyer, activist, law professor at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii, and one of the founding creators of critical race theory. In the last 12 months, we've heard so much about racial justice and about critical race theory, but I bet that many of us don't know what it is and what it's all about. So we're so thrilled to have Professor Matsuda on the podcast today to explain what critical race theory actually is, what it aims to achieve, and how it has helped us understand the way racism is institutionalized in our society. What we try to push as critical race theorists is the understanding that because of this legacy of racism, our law, our institutional structures are built in a way that reproduces racial hierarchies over and over. The traditional way of thinking about this in the law is there is racism, but it's an epiphenomena. It's an outlier. It's a bad guy that has these ridiculous racist ideas. And we have to look for that bad guy and get him to stop being racist. That model doesn't get at the real problem, which is if racism is systemic, it's going to show up in all our practices and it might be perpetrated by people who are good people, who don't think of themselves as racist. We discuss the practical application of the theory in pursuing a just society, inequality as a threat to freedom and free speech in the marketplace of ideas. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Aloha, Mila. It's great to be here speaking with you. In this time, I thought we would start with the basics. Since you are one of the creators of critical race theory, can you explain what critical race theory is? Sure. Critical race theory is a theory of justice, and it places intersectional anti-racism at the center of analysis of law and politics and power. Most of us were lawyers, and it was designed to respond to the American legal system's endemic racism. So we ask questions like, where does this idea of race come from? How is it deployed to structure institutions so that some people are advantaged? An obvious example of this is slavery, an institution that was dependent on the idea of race and white supremacy. The legacy of this kind of thinking permeates law and social life. I would add another example, genocidal land stealing from Native people, justified with this idea that some people deserve to take and some people don't utilize what they have and should be displaced. That's a racist idea. Critical race theory is designed to reveal, interrogate, think about where these ideas come from, how they were deployed, and how we still live with them today in our institutions, in our social life. Thank you. That's very well explained. I think that's one of the things that's really not fully understood. This is not how we conceive of it in popular lore when you learn about colonization and it's not cast as being racist to take over the lands of Native Americans and to shunt them in reservations. It's written in a way that it's not immediately obvious that this is a racist practice. And we don't talk about that. 
like ever. <laughs> I mean, we do it today, but that seems relatively new to me. How can we achieve justice through critical race theory? What we try to push as critical race theorists is the understanding that because of this legacy of racism, our law, our institutional structures are built in a way that reproduces racial hierarchies over and over. The traditional way of thinking about this in the law is there is racism, but it's an epiphenomena. It's an outlier. It's a bad guy that has these ridiculous racist ideas. And we have to look for that bad guy and get him to stop being racist. That model doesn't get at the real problem, which is if racism is systemic, it's going to show up in all our practices and it might be perpetrated by people who are good people, who don't think of themselves as racist. So we try to reveal this to show the ways in which institutions, for example, a university or a police department or a corporation, might not have an explicit racist agenda that they're aware of, but because they are embedded in a social system and an economic system and a received history of structural racism, they will inevitably reproduce racial hierarchy unless they affirmatively put in place anti-racist practices. And this is why we support affirmative action. Can you explain in what way affirmative action is an anti-racist practice? Because right now, I think people misunderstand it as a practice of unfairness. All right, let me give you an example that I remember from when I was first starting out in the legal profession. I worked at one law firm where every time you did a job for someone, they would fill out a form about what they thought of your work. And the last question on the form was, is this our kind of person? And they meant, how will this person fit in with the culture of our place? And that question, is this our kind of person, is an innocent question if you don't understand how racism and sexism and class bias operate. But if you have a little bit of knowledge of the psychology and sociology of how this operates, you know that people naturally have an affinity toward people who are like themselves. And they'll overlook the qualities that really matter. Can this person get the job done? How are they functioning in the workplace? What is the quality of their work product? And they'll go to that question, do I feel comfortable around this person? Are they one of us? Are they going to fit in? And that's where the racism and the sexism and the door closing operates. You know, we wonder why the glass ceiling is still there, that after years and years of women showing that they can do the work, achieving academically and achieving in professional accomplishments, they're still not taking the leadership positions. That happens because of the systemic and unconscious ways in which bias operates and subordination is replicated. The way you change that is by affirmatively paying attention to inclusion. So if you're doing a job search, make sure that there are women and people of color in that applicant pool, right? Affirmative action does not mean that you hire incompetent people, but it means you expand who you're looking at and you interrogate your institution to make sure that you're not excluding in ways that are not helpful, right? And that means you have to go out and actively recruit, retain, and hire the kinds of people that have not made up a significant portion of your institution. This is the unspoken part that you don't hire people who are incompetent, but I think people gloss over that. One of the things that you talk about in terms of dismantling racism is to do utopian work, to imagine a world of mutual care and mutual respect. What does that world look like? It's beautiful. 
I often ask my students to do this exercise with me and the kinds of things they talk about are, first of all, not having economic anxiety all the time. You know, what am I going to do if my car breaks down? Uh, will I get a job? Will I ever be able to have my own house and family? How will I afford it? So the first thing we're going to fight for is an end to that kind of economic insecurity. Everyone should know that they're going to have a safe place to live, that their basic needs of food and medical care, education will be available to them as a human right. But I also want to see a world that's full of joy and creativity so that we would promote lifelong learning and participation in the arts. My students have told me they'd love to see a learning center in every community where you could go and there'd be tools you could borrow and someone to show you how to use them. There'd be music, there'd be theater, there'd be dance, not just for the people who are incredibly gifted, but for people who are maybe not so gifted but want to develop a skill and use it in conjunction with others. Many of us in our families have had to worry about how we're going to take care of child care or elder care. Why not combine child care and elder care and creative practice in one place so we can pay dancers to dance and teachers to teach in a place where elder care and infant care are going on at the same time? The ideas are endless, uh, and we can just start with our own lives and the things that are so hard right now. So in this world, where does justice fit in, and how do you practice justice in this kind of environment? So when I say having a utopian vision is important, I think we have to develop that muscle of visioning, of imagining what a better way would look like. And then we have to join together in struggle to get there. And there are many, many different roads to doing that. For some people, it's participating in electoral politics. For other people, it's being a disruptor, getting in the streets and making it impossible for business to proceed as usual when your community is under attack. All of us have an obligation, particularly now because it's such a moment of crisis with the threat of climate chaos and the growing disparities between haves and have-nots and the pandemic that we've lived through. In this moment of crisis, we do have to figure out how we are going to go out and make change, each and every one of us, together with other people. Yes, that's the tricky part. It's very difficult to get people to do things together. As you've seen, the collective action problem is a real problem in this country, although I am heartened that so many people voted in this last election, at the very least. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's hard and it's not hard. <laughs> the part that's hard is the levels of distrust and the weakness of some of our primary institutions of change, like the labor movement, which has always been on the forefront of pushing progressive change, has been so weakened by the attacks, really, that have been going on for decades. So that's the hard part. But the easy part is that human beings are social animals. They really want to be with other people. You know, if you look at how people poured into the streets and were dancing at the outcome of the last election, just for the joy of being around other people and jumping up and down and, and the DJ is playing and people are dancing and it's wonderful. People want that. They want to be around other people. And in celebrating the election, they were celebrating something that meant something deeply to them about a better future. That feeling is amazing. And people want it. So what we have to do is create more and more spaces where people can have that feeling, that feeling of joy and solidarity. I'm here with other people who care about ending racism, ending war, ending poverty, 
and imagining a better world for ourselves. We're going to work for it together. Thank you for reminding us of the dancing in the streets. This joy notwithstanding, the Trump administration directly attacked workplace diversity training and denounced critical race theory. And of course, we have been swimming in decades worth of attacks of this ilk. And in the last four years, I would say it has only intensified. Why is critical race theory under attack now? And what is the most common avenue for attacks? Any movement for social change that is achieving some success in dismantling structures of subordination is going to get a backlash. So in a way, that's how you know you're winning when they come after you. (laughs) So you've seen the attack on Black Lives Matter, the attack on critical race theory, in part because of the success of the large numbers of people that are opening their eyes to the reality of racism and understanding how it hurts all of us. I think another part of it is that it's incredibly useful to authoritarians and demagogues to create an enemy. And historically in this country, race has always been used that way to turn white workers against black and brown workers, for instance, say they're taking your jobs, not the corporations that have done everything they can to kill unions and take jobs overseas and kill all the regulations that protect health and safety of workers. Your problem is those immigrants. You're in our tribe. Come on over here (laughs) with the bankers and corporations that are actually stealing money from you. We're your tribe. Come over with us and don't act in solidarity with those other poor and working people who are culturally, ethnically, racially, religiously different from you. That's not your tribe. This is an old trick. And unfortunately, it works because it gives people a way to feel an affinity, even if it's a false affinity and a place of community and safety. Again, it's a lie, but it's a lie that some people might need when they're particularly vulnerable. So Trump has stumbled on this. I don't think he's a genius. He just kind of uses his own bullying personality and character to pick up on these racist tropes, but they've been quite useful to him. And got him all the way to the White House. Yes, he definitely was very deft at using this rhetoric of hate against people. It's been used forever, basically, for millennia. It's incredibly harmful to us as a society and, of course, to specific populations who are the target of this kind of harmful speech. Here in the United States, we're a culture that values all speech, Why should we consider restraints on harmful speech? Precisely because we value all speech, we have to pay attention to the kinds of assaults that shut down speech. So we've seen this multiply, particularly with hate speech and assaultive speech multiplied exponentially by the Internet. There are women that have decided to withdraw from public life, people that actually were once elected officials that are no longer elected officials, women that wrote books and canceled their book tours, women who were speaking out as journalists and decided to choose another profession because once you get targeted, it becomes overwhelming and particularly in a culture where violence against women is commonplace, women have felt for their own protection that they've had to shut down and stop participating in the marketplace of ideas. So the idea that we should just let everything out there and the good ideas will rise to the top has not worked out so well. Uh, When you've got social media designed to amplify through their algorithms the worst kinds of disinformation and racism and misogyny. 
you're not going to get that wonderful cacophony that you need in a democracy with everybody bringing their ideas to the table and arguing it out so we can test our ideas against other ideas and figure out the best way to move our country forward. That vision has been completely destroyed by the proliferation of assaultive speech and lies that have taken over the marketplace of ideas. So if you want to use economic metaphors, which I'm actually not that fond of, you have a market failure and a distortion of the market that has made it impossible really for the market to function. When that happens in an actual marketplace like the stock market, the regulators move in to try and make it safer for investors to be able to trust the market. But we haven't applied that same kind of thinking to speech. I love that analogy. I have never heard it, but it's so apt. I wish we would use it more often. All podcasters know the best way to grow your show is through word of mouth. We created a referral link that makes it easy to share the podcast by text, email, or DM to anyone you know who could use a little dose of inspiration for civic engagement and our collective future. Follow the link in our show notes to go to our referral page. You can easily share a unique referral code directly from there. Once you share our show with five friends who download the podcast, I'll send you a handwritten thank you note and a future hindsight button to thank you for your support. If you share it with 10 friends who download an episode, I'll send you a branded future hindsight moleskin notebook. Yup, a real moleskin notebook with our logo on it. Thank you for spreading the word and thank you for listening. One of the things that you also touched on is about the asymmetry of how information is disseminated by the internet, but also some people have a bigger megaphone than others. You've argued that inequality is the greatest threat to freedom of expression, which I think plays into this idea of having a level field marketplace of ideas. Why is inequality the greatest threat to freedom of expression? There's so many reasons, but I'll just talk about a few. One is the monopolization and corporatization of information chains. There are fewer and fewer places that people are going to get information. It's very hard to not participate, for instance, in social media, but those spaces are controlled by people that can shape what information you have access to. And increasingly, we're not always getting the best information. Then there's the idea of who is worth listening to, who's considered smart, whose ideas are worthy, who is heard when they speak. And these structures of racism, sexism, change how your speech is heard when you speak up. So it's almost a joke you see on sitcoms when people are sitting down in an office to brainstorm and a woman says something, nobody acknowledges it. A man says the same thing five minutes later and everybody jumps on the idea and the woman's kind of say, well, what, what happened to when I said the exact same thing? How come nobody thought it was a good idea then? That's a product of, of inequality, of sexism. And then there's the inequality that limits your access to speech, right? You and I are talking now because I am privileged enough to have a good computer and Wi-Fi. A lot of people don't have that. <laughs> there's already a moat that keeps some people out based on economic privilege. And the same thing for your listeners. So not everybody gets to listen to your podcast, which is trying to keep the conversation at a level of truth <laughs> and integrity. If that's the kind of information you want to get, you have to have internet access. And then there's education. In order to be thought of as an articulate person who can spread your ideas, you have to be able to type on a keyboard and get your ideas out there. I don't want to fall in the trap of thinking that people without education are not good communicators because there are a lot of good communicators out there who never get the benefit of a good education. But I think there are habits of critical thinking and of feeling that the life of the mind matters and that your ideas 
will matter and be listened to by others that are a product of educational privilege. And that's something that we withhold from the majority of people in our country. And all of these things have impacts on speech, on speech production, on whose speech is heard, how information gets disseminated, and how we value it. The last thing I want to say is just the corrupting effect of money. So whose speech is heard in Congress? Whose speech is going to affect who Biden picks for his cabinet? All of that is impacted by the corrupting effects of money and the way money has invaded politics, right? Who is able to make those contributions to the big PACs? All of this is affecting decision-making and money has become speech in that sense. So that you and I, Mila, might have good ideas about a utopian future that we want for our children and grandchildren we don't get the same audience that somebody with big money gets if we go to Washington to talk about our ideas. So the corrupting effect when money becomes speech, as it has in this country, is something we have to address if we care about free speech. Yes, I agree 100%. We definitely need to address that. You're also an artist. How does your work in critical theory intersect with the art that you make. I watched the reading of the Manifesto of Radical Intersubjective Collectivity and Imagined Possibility. What were you thinking when you wrote it and what were you trying to convey? I'm really saying the same thing in my legal theory and in my art, but in legal writing, you break it down. This is the way things are, one, two, three. This is the way we can change it, four, five, six. Here are some counter arguments, and here's my response to the counter arguments. Very didactic. And that work is important because we're trying to create new narratives, new ideology, and it's useful to break it down. With art, I'm trying to do something where I'm reaching from my heart to your heart. So it's emotional, it's effective, it's subjective. The impact of something visual or auditory, something sensory, kinesthetic, on the emotions to draw people together, to recognize our common humanity, is something that we can do with art, music, food, in a way that is stronger at the emotional level than laying it out through words the way a law professor would. I love that. So as an everyday person, as somebody who is not an artist or a lawyer, what are two things I could be doing to advance our path to justice and to be anti-racist? I think the two things I would ask start inward and go outward. So inward, we all have an obligation of self-education because if you were educated in this country, you got an education that was deficient in information, basic history, anthropology, politics, what we call ethnic studies, the history of the many peoples that make up this place the ways that racism has operated and the struggles that people have engaged in to try and create a more fair and just country. These things are not taught for the most part. And if they are, they're covered superficially. So we all have an obligation to go to the library and get those books and start learning. That's number one. And that's a lot of fun, by the way, doing that. But number two is then to take that knowledge and go outward. So people really have to join something. And at this point, I don't care what they join, but any organization that's working to try and make change needs your support right now. So just pick one and join and support. And don't think of change as something that happens without engaging with other human beings. We have to figure out ways to keep talking to one another 
because there are big changes that have to happen in a very short time period. And to prepare for that, we have to have strong social bonds. So for some people, even if it's just working with your church to make sure that people have food, that's a start. It's a way to reach out and develop the social skills and practices of being together. (laughs) There's a lot in contemporary life that sends us into little corners where we don't do that and we have to break out. And I think that's what you're trying to do with this podcast. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I definitely agree that we need to work together. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Oh, so many things make me hopeful. I'll start with my students. I have been teaching for 40 years, and I have never seen a group of young people, this this generation, that is so full of questioning, of righteous anger, and of imagination. I think they've lived through economic collapse and pandemic, and they just understand that business as usual is going to get us all killed, and they want change, and they are active in questioning, challenging, trying to figure out how to make things better. The Native people I'm an ally to give me great hope. Here in Hawaii, they are building their nation and imagining a future for us that's free of militarism and greed and environmental destruction. And they are organized, they're fierce, and I predict that they're going to alter power distributions permanently in Hawaii. Things like the Black Lives Matter movement give me hope and all the young people who are rising up with them. Watching Joe Biden talk about systemic racism. Now, that's not a normal part of his vocabulary, but he's been educated by Black Lives Matter. And that gives me great hope. The thing that makes me feel optimistic the most is that I know a lot of organizers walking the streets going house to house, talking to people, and listening to people, one person at a time, one neighborhood at a time. And they're bringing us all into this long conversation that's turning into a movement that's going to build this world, this world that, in which all of us get to be our best selves and live our best lives. And that world's going to have a lot of art and a lot of music and a lot of dancing. And you're not going to be alone. There always will be someone who will care about you. And you'll always have a way to show care for others. I see people with an intention and a method bringing that about. And they're out there right now knocking on doors. Because of that, I feel incredibly optimistic and hopeful. I hope all that you envision will come true. And I share your dream. I share your dream. Thank you very much for being on Future Hindsight. And thank you for your deep scholarship, your dedication to humanity. Thank you so much, Mila. I have loved talking to you. This episode is filled with evidence on how racism is baked into the way our society functions and why justice is incomplete without equality. I believe that we can work together for a more just future. The utopian vision is, after all, first and foremost practical. Economic security is a foundation that underpins our dreams of a world where there's joy and creativity in our collective humanity. We've heard it before on this podcast, and it bears repeating. Join and support an organization. I also quite like the analogy of the marketplace of ideas. Indeed, The proliferation of hate speech and lies have corrupted our public discourse and has made it unsafe. If you want to hear more on this topic, please revisit our season on post-truth or read Professor Matsuda's book, Words That Wound, Critical Race Theory, Assault of Speech, and the First Amendment. Next week, our guest is Richard Rothstein. He's the author of The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. 
It uncovers how federal, state, and local policy explicitly created racially homogeneous neighborhoods that violate the Constitution and require remediation. We have a myth that the reason we're segregated in every metropolitan area of this country is because of private activity. It's not just income differences. We think it was because private actors like banks and real estate agencies and developers wouldn't sell to African-Americans or maybe bigoted white homeowners and landlords wouldn't rent to them. The reality is that the reason we are segregated is because of a set of racially explicit federal, state, and local policies they were designed to ensure that African-Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area of the country. We discussed the indisputable proof that African-Americans have been the subject of discrimination by the government through public policy in all aspects of life, well beyond housing, and the continued marginalization of African-American communities today. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos. The audio producer is Peter Fedak. And our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sion. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.